Well, I would love to welcome all of you to Journey Church Online. Just want to say we feel so honored that you brought us into your living room during this difficult season that we are walking through. And I also want to say that I am really excited today to help walk us through how to experience peace on the inside, even though there's panic on the outside. And I believe that today is going to be a very helpful service for all of you guys. Now, before we get into today's service, I wanted to give you a little update on what your church has been up to during this time of crisis. See, some people are under the illusion that Journey Church is closed. Can I tell you something? That couldn't be farther from the truth. We have actually never been busier than we are right now. And I don't think we've ever been needed more than we are right now. You see, the church isn't closed. We've just left the building and have moved more into the communities and more into the homes, which by the way, is what God has always desired the church to be. So let me just give you some updates of how we've been serving our community during this time. First of all, when we heard about what was going on, we began to immediately step in to meet the needs of the local children that we are aware of. And so we contacted Palm Beach County school officials, of which there's over 100,000 children that are on free or reduced lunch. And we have packed over 20,000 meal packs to help underprivileged children that are in need. We've also been reaching out and helping uh, law enforcement, medical staff, first responders, and even retailers, bringing them supplies that they might need as well as giving them some encouragement because they have been so um, just stretched and pushed during this time serving our community. We've also launched a special grocery and supply delivery system that we're going to be implementing across Palm Beach County for those people that are in the greatest need. The people that we're going to serve and reach are these. If you are elderly, if you're a single mom or a widow or have special needs or a weakened immune system through this coronavirus or in somewhat or in quarantine, where you cannot leave and need help. Our church is gonna be there to meet your need. And so we have got supplies, which you can see all around us, um, already ready to go. And we are gonna be delivering to your door, to those people who have special needs or these kind of situations, um, the supplies you need to take care of you in this time. So if you are in need, or if you know someone is in need, Go to our website at gojourneychurch.com and then you'll see a Go and Love link. Click on that Glow and Love link and you will find instructions how to fill out a form so that we can meet your need free of charge. We're not just doing this for our own church, by the way. We've actually reached out to local law enforcement and across the county, your church is going to be serving the people in the greatest need during this time of crisis. And I just know God is so proud of us for being the church that Jesus created the church to be. And that's what we're doing in the community. But we're also ministering to people in their homes. We are at a time where people more than ever have free time or have time on their hands where we can actually bring Jesus, bring the church into their homes. And we set a record last week of reaching more people than we ever have, by the way, not even in our buildings, but in people's homes. So we're not only reaching them with church online through your watch parties that we're hosting online, but we're also providing content for parents to teach their children spiritually. And all of this stuff is on our website. You can go to gojourneychurch.com to get download materials, to watch videos with your kids and experience all of these things. See, our church is not closed. We have just left the building and we're going into homes and into communities. And so I just want to, as your pastor, thank you so much for your generosity during this time. You guys have shocked us of how generous you guys have been, even though there's so much uncertainty, even though so many of you are going through so many difficult times. And I just want to thank you for being the church during this season. When it's darkest is when light is needed the most. So I love you guys so much, and I hope this service blesses you. Hey, Journey Church, wherever you're at, we pray that you're blessed. We pray that the presence of God invades that space where you're worshiping today. Come on, let's lift our voices. Lift this up and sing. He's coming on the cloud. He's the lion and the lamb. We worship him. Come on, right where you're at, would you sing together? Lift your hands and celebrate who he is today. Let's sing. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Declare his praise. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? We say, Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And 
over our families, our country, the situation you find yourself in right now, proclaim the truth. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, in the face of anxiety and worry we sing. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it again. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord? Oh, let faith rise in your heart. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord? Oh, we sing, sing it in faith. So our God is the light. sing right where you are that I'm no longer a slave to fear we sing that I am a child of God oh we believe that I'm no longer a slave to fear cause I am a child of God yes I am from my mother's womb, oh, you have chosen me, and your love has called my name. I've been born again, and I've been born again into your family, cause your blood flows through my veins. We see that I'm no Sing right where you are. Then I'm no longer. 
so excited to be with you today wherever you are wherever you gather to worship we're honored to be with you and we just want to remind you today that wherever you are even in the chaos that may surround us when you turn on the news when you look around when you go outside you know that Jesus stands with you too and whatever fire you might find yourself in today you don't stand there alone but you stand there with a perfect savior that loves you and promises to deliver you. So we stand on that hope today. Let's lift it up. God, we love you so much. Lord, we thank you that wherever we are, you are there too. God, that we're surrounded by your presence at all times. And that's the hope that we stand on today. Jesus, that wherever we go, you stand in the fire with us worship you. Thank you. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, oh, I know I will never be there's another in the fire and standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the sea and should i ever need reminding of how i've been set free there's a cross that bears the burden will another die for me Fall in the streets between what you mean to me and this reckoning. Either way, I will bow to the things of the sea. Cause I know. See you. 
other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen. that just was. And if you're a church family member or if you're new here, man, we just want to welcome you. Thank you for hanging out and checking this stream out with us. Uh, my name is Josh and this is Amanda. She's our director of outreach. I'm one of our pastors here at Journey Church. And we're here to just, man, breathe some life into you, to encourage you, to share some really good news amidst this whole COVID-19 outbreak and all the craziness that's going on in our world. We actually have some really cool things to share. So Journey Church, last weekend was a historic weekend for Journey Church. We actually had record attendance. And you're like, what? What do you mean record attendance? We weren't here. That's right, we weren't here on campus. You were actually in your homes, online, checking in, inviting people over for those incredible watch parties. We had over 6,000 of you watching online, which is just amazing. So well done, way to be the church in this time. And speaking of, Amanda has a really cool story of how you guys have been the church during this difficult time as well. Yeah, well thanks Josh. So church, we have had outreach teams in the community serving and being the light and the hope of the world that God created the church to be. And I wanna share with you one story of how we are responding to the local needs in our community right now. Church, we were contacted by local law enforcement, which is an incredible partnership that we have. And there is a family who really lost everything in a, in a house fire. And this is a grandma who selflessly is serving her family by caring for her two grandsons. The mother passed away in 2015. She's also caring for her 33-year-old son who is wheelchair bound with cerebral palsy. But you know what? This happened, but we are here to bring hope to the hopeless. And so we had a team there last Saturday cleaning up their, the mess, cleaning up the ashes, ripping down the walls of this home, guys. And you know what? We're gonna help rebuild, church. We're not done yet, and it's because of your generosity that we are able to be a light and a beacon of hope in our local community. That's awesome. Hey, yeah. job well. Uh, oh. Job well done. There you go. So, so awesome, man. We're so excited to, just in the midst of all of this, that, that the church is being the church. And really that gets us so fired up, so well done. And really church, all of that happens, the love and the, the generosity happens because of your giving, your faithful giving. So we just wanna thank you for that. The book of Proverbs actually says that, 
that whoever refreshes another with a gift is refreshed. And we want to encourage you with that, that even in this difficult season, your giving actually allows us to continue to be the church, the light and the hope to this community. So well done. We're excited about jumping into this message today. Amanda, would you just pray for us as we enter in? Absolutely. Well, thanks, Josh. Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for who you are. And God, I pray against anxiety. I pray against fear in every living room in South Florida right now. And God, just insert your peace and your joy and your presence and open our hearts for what Pastor Scott has for us today. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I just want to welcome all of you guys to week number two as we are bringing Journey Church into your homes. And I just want to start out by saying how proud I am of so many of you that have been hosting watch parties uh, either online or, or in your homes. And what's so amazing about all of this is this, is that we actually looked at the number of people that were watching Journey Church. And last week, we probably had more people be a part of what Journey Church is doing in their homes than we did in our building the week before. And I love this because the church is not a building, that you are the church, that we are the church and we are the body of Christ. And this is an incredible opportunity for us to come together and be the church that Jesus created the church to be and invite our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones to be a part of this. And so if you're part of a Journey Church watch party, we're just so glad that you are here. Um, once again, we'd love you to take pictures and share. Um, you can actually just put it um, on our, on, uh, on our um, you can actually post something to hashtag Journey watch, par watch parties. Um, and then we can kind of all see how all of us are gathering in our homes all across our community. I love the fact that our church is not shutting down. Um, our church is simply moving from this building into homes all across our county. And by the way, across state to state and all over the world. And I just really believe that God is going to use this next season to draw so many people that maybe drifted away back to him because they're going to need a supernatural peace. And, and over this next couple of weeks, we're actually walking through in a series on how to stress less. And we're going to kind of shift our focus a little bit more over these weeks to kind of deal with this idea of worry, anxiety, and fear and how they impact the stress that you and I experience in our lives. We're actually going to be also creating some more content you're going to be hearing a lot more about coming over the next coming weeks um, with worship experiences and stuff for your children. And so we're we're going to keep helping you reach your community and ministering to you to help you experience greater peace in your life. And so um, over last week and this week and next week, the goal is to give you three tools to have greater peace on the inside even when it's panic and craziness on the outside. And so that's what we started out this series with the step number one, like an important thing that all of us need to do if we want to experience peace, and that's this. We need to choose to fill your mind with things that produce peace. That peace isn't some magic thing you just kind of conjure up. It's not just some pill that you can take. It's not something you just want in the moment. Okay, I just want peace. That there is a connection to the peace you're experiencing today with with what you have filled your mind with in the past. That we just can't expect peace to show up. That there is a connection and correlation to what you're experiencing in your life when it comes to peace and what you choose to fill your mind with. In fact, we looked at Philippians 4.8 and we kind of focused on how we're supposed to focus our mind and fill our mind with things that actually produce peace. That finally, brothers, here's the, here's the call for us, that finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is truth, right, God's word, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, without kind of any dirtiness or darkness in there, whatever is lovely, what it motivates you to serve and to love, whatever is admirable, and if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, here's the challenge, think about such things. That the heartbeat that we're supposed to do is we're supposed to make sure to fill our minds and to focus our minds on things that produce peace. And we need to make that decision. And when we choose to do that, here's the promise that God gives every one of us. That whatever you have learned and what you filled your mind with, right, or received as you spent this time with God, or heard from me, or seen in me through your communities, right, put into practice, and the God of, and here's the word we're looking for, peace will be with 
you. What an incredible promise that as we begin to deposit these amazing things of God's word and serving our community and whatever is pure and noble and holy and meditating and ruminating and thinking on these things, that the peace and the presence of God begins to just flood us to guard our hearts and our minds so we can experience a peace that surpasses understanding. But remember something. We've got to make the decision to deposit these things in our mind. And we talked about this last week, but this, you cannot withdraw something from your mind that you haven't deposited in your mind. And so if you guys want to experience peace, and I know God wants this for you, and I know we want this for you, I know I want this for my own self, then we've got to be disciplined to look and examine of what we are filling our minds with and to make sure we're filling our minds with things that produce peace. Peace. Now today, um, I want to give us the second part of this, and the second part of this is, is, is equally important, but, but it's connected. And, and if we could, here's the first week we kind of looked at this, right? To choose to fill your mind with things that produce peace. The second one of this is connected to it, and that we need to choose to focus your mind on things that produce peace peace. It's not just about filling. That's part of it. We got to choose to also focus what we are thinking on. Now, it's hard to focus if you haven't filled, but we need to make sure and understand that we need to choose and that we're in control on what we choose to focus our minds and our thoughts on. Now, remember something last week we looked at this, right? That, that, the, that the mind was the key battlefield for stress or for peace or anxiety and how we live. In fact, the, the, the doctor, the medical doctor that coined the word stress, that studied all of this and understood how it worked, and we looked at his quote last week, that what he taught us as the key component to defeating stress and living in peace was you must use the most powerful pharmacy in the world, right? It's a medical doctor, which is right between your ears. That your mind and your thoughts are going to be the primary battlefield for experiencing peace on the inside. That even though it's crazy on the outside, how you respond to those circumstances, and whether you're plagued with stress and fear and anxiety and still go through uncertainty, or you have peace in the midst of the uncertainty will actually connect on what you focus your mind on. And this is what I love. Do you realize that thousands of years before these doctors came up with this understanding of how powerful what you focus on connects to what you feel in your emotions, whether it's stress or peace, God's word actually already taught us. And I love the fact of this because it just reminds all of us that God is your creator, that God is not just in control of all things, although he is, but that God knows how you are wired because he created you in his image. And he knows how to give you tools to help you walk in peace and in victory in the midst of crazy times. And so I want to look at some instructions that God's word gives us to help us experience this peace. Go ahead and look. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. The weapons that we fight with, right? What are we fighting for? We're fighting for peace. With, with, with are not the weapons of the world. Like God's given us really special powers and ability. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish stronghold. What's a stronghold? Fear, worry, and anxiety. We, we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And so what God is saying to you is we're not powerless. That God has given us weapons that we can actually do battle. We can actually fight and find victory against strongholds like fear and anxiety and all of these things. That we need to understand something. This is not the first, you know, crazy time in the world. That we have gone through H1N1. We've gone through its swine flu. We've gone through SARS, 9-11. And this isn't the first, nor is it going to be the last. But God is saying to us, you are not powerless. Powerless, and I have actually given you weapons to battle to find peace in the midst of uncertainty. And notice where, once again, just like the doctor that coined the word stress, notice where God tells us is the key place to win the battle and experience the peace. And notice what he says next. And we have got to take captive or control every, and there's that word, thought, our mind. And we need to make it obedient to Christ. 
Isn't it awesome, once again, that God knew that the battlefield for peace would actually begin in your mind, not somewhere on the outside, but actually something you control on the inside. Now, this verse helps us understand two things that I want us to focus on today. And here's the two things. The first is this, that God has given us authority over our minds, right? He's told us to take captive, right? He's told us to take captive. And so what he's saying to us is that we have been given authority in our minds when it comes to what we think, that we can no longer use the excuse, oh, I just, I'm a worrier. I just, my mom was a worrier, and I just got to go on Facebook and remind everybody about the end of the world and post every report from the CDC of all the problems, and I just got to, I just can't control it. I mean, this is just my personality. I'm a worrier. And to what God would say to you is, no, it's not. That you have been given authority. By the way, he wouldn't have given you the command if you could not do anything. It. So you have the authority. By the way, doctors, you're going to learn in a moment here, will also tell you the same thing that God has, that you have authority. And here's the second thing that verse tells us that we need to understand, and that is this. We need to choose to take that authority. We need to choose to take captive every single thought. It's not enough that we once again go, okay, God, you've given us the ability to do it. Now we've got to choose to step into obedience. If we want to experience the peace, we've got to step into obedience. Go, Okay, God, I'm going to take control over my thoughts that are in my head that my mind is focusing on. We are going to learn of why it's so important to make sure that we control what we focus on. Now, many of you know, as I've shared this throughout this whole series, that part of what I did to study this was not just look at the Bible, although the Bible is awesome and powerful, but I also wanted to research what medical doctors taught us about stress, anxiety, worry, and fear, and how they impacted our life. And so one of the books that I read uh, was a book by the Mayo Clinic that's called The Mayo Clinic's Guide to Stress-Free Living. And, and it's an incredible, insightful very boring book that I kind of read a lot. My wife actually helped me read some as well to study, to understand how stress and anxiety Im impact our lives and how do we fix the problems. And here's what I found so fascinating about what the Mayo Clinic, one of their premier hospitals, group of doctors in all of the world, when they were studying how we can battle, how once again they realized the same thing it said in the scriptures, that the battlefield is in our mind. And in one of the chapters, they begin to reveal to us how it is and some things that we can do to once again live at peace. In order to do that, though, you and I have got to understand on how our mind actually works. And here's what they found in their study, that your brain which is the most amazing, by the way, computer, if you will, or the ma most amazing organism in all of creation, the, the greatest supercomputer in the world can't even do what your brain and your mind can do. It is an amazing, amazing thing. Imagine 85 billion light bulbs in your head with trillions of touch points, and the left side and the right side, and all of them work together, and your brain is magnificent. But as magnificent as your brain is, your brain runs in two primary modes. And the first mode that your brain runs into is what is called the focused or focused mode. And this is what happens when your brain is on a task. You're trying to solve a problem, fulfill something that you're walking through. And what takes place when you're in focus mode, which means you are taking control of your thoughts. You're taking control, you're taking authority over it, and you're directing your thoughts and the energy of your mind to solve a problem or to do something that you're trying to accomplish. Now what happens is it creates in your brain what's called a task positive network. And it networks the parts of your mind that help you fulfill what you're focused on doing. And when you do this, a couple of things happen. You begin to shut off parts of your brain that aren't directed towards what you're focused on or the task. And all of the energy begins to go towards what it is you've directed your mind to solve or to do in your life. This is why, by the way, you can be in the middle of work and you're so engaged in, in this project, you're not even being in tune to what's happening. You're not thinking about the future, you're not thinking about the past, your mind is completely focused on the task at hand. This is why, by the way, if, if you're ever driving in a car and you're lost, so I'm speaking to, to women here because men never get lost, right? We, we don't do that. Um, and if you've ever been like that, like I have been, and there you are driving and you're trying to think and focus on getting to where you're going, what is it that you do? Turn the radio off. Kids, shut up. Just stop talking. I can't. Nobody say a word. Why? 
Because what's happening is our brain in the focus mode, we're, we're taking control of our mind and we're directing it and we're trying to then tune out everything else that isn't what we are directing the focus on, okay? That is the first mode. Now, the second mode, which by the way, they've studied to show, um, is the mode that we spend more than half of our days in, is what's called the default mode. And this is where I wanna focus a little bit on today. Because what they found in this study, which, which, which shocked the scientists, is that when people weren't in focus mode, which they were taking control of their mind, that what would take place is their mind actually didn't even work less. That in default mode, their brain was just as active, just as busy, but what happened in default mode is that different parts of your brain begin to light up and begin energized, and so we're using just as much mini, uh, energy as focus mode, but different parts of our brain are fired up and going, you know, moving and moving and moving. And here's what they found in, once again, the Mayo Clinic of what your brain does naturally. Okay, why you have to, take, why, why you have to focus when you're in default mode? There are four things that your mind drifts to naturally. By the way, my mind and your mind, and this is exactly why God gave us the command. And here are the four things when you're in default mode. What's default mode? It's when you're not taking control of your brain, you're letting your brain take control of whatever it wants to do. And when your brain is in control and you've not given a direction or a focus, here's what your brain wants to think about, and there are four things, and here they are. The first is this. Your brain wants to think about present threats. This is just natural, keeps you safe. What are all the problems I'm facing right now? Who is that guy that may be after my girl? Who is that person that could take my promotion? What are all the problems right now that could be around? Because I've got to once again live in this problem solving mode, right? So your brain drifts there. The second thing your brain drifts towards um, is, is personal flaws. Is that when you begin to get in that, in that kind of default mode, you start thinking about all the things that are wrong with you. You, you ever been there? I wish, I wish I was as good at making money as that guy. I wish I looked as pretty as she did. I wish I was good at solving problems like that person. Man, I just got to get better at this. I got to finally get in shape. I've got to eat healthier. I've got to figure out my schedule. It's crazy. And so what happens is you start to think about in default mode, what are the present threats right now I got to protect? What are all of the problems in my life and all the things that I don't measure up to that I should do? And we focus on past hurts and future problems. In other words, that your mind drifts out of the present and being fully present and enjoying life. And in default mode, it goes to all of these other things, like, like past hurts. You ever, you ever been there and you're sitting there and you're trying to go to sleep and your mind is in default mode, right? And what do you do? You drift to all these things. You start remembering all the times that people hurt you. You start remembering that, that, that hurtful word that someone said. You start remembering how bad things used to be. You, you, re, you relive arguments in your mind. You, you ever been there? Like, like you're in the shower and, and because you're in default mode, your mind just drifts. And you're remembering the argument you had with someone and now you came up with the perfect thing to say. Like you didn't then, you just were like, ah. Oh. But now like, oh, I wish I had that opportunity. Why? Because you're going to past hurts. It was interesting. My son, Scotty, um, was, was kind of down one day and he came to me and goes, what happened? And, and one of the kids on the team, he was playing soccer in, during school, told him that he was the worst soccer player in the world. That's what he told him. Now, the good news is soccer is not even a real sport, so it didn't really, didn't really matter. But beyond that, what he was doing is he was letting this past hurt. He was rethinking about what was saying, replaying it in his mind. And I remember coming up to him. Hey, buddy, listen. People that say negative things oftentimes are the ones that are hurt and they're just angry and they just said that he he didn't really mean that you're you're not the worst one now listen the next time the next time he says that to you here's what you say no i'm not you haven't seen my grandma play right because what happens in these moments is that we begin to once again think of past hurts or we think of future problems well if the market crashes what if the hospitals are full? If I lose my job, what's gonna take place? Will I ever get married? What's gonna take place with the college debt? Am I gonna be able to find a job? I went through school, right? And so what happens in default mode, and this is what I want you to see, is that when you don't take control, when you don't obey the command that God has given you, and you just let your mind drift, you will naturally drift to living in these things. And as your mind lives in these things, I want you to see what's happening inside of you. You can't enjoy the present, can you? 
You can't be fully present with those that you love. It's hard to experience peace peace and faith and joy. But if you learn to do what God commanded you to do, you take captive of every single thought. You're filling your mind with peace and you're focusing your mind on things that produce peace. All of a sudden, you're able to walk in greater peace. You're able to enjoy the present moments because you have taken the authority over your mind, which God has given you, to focus on the things that produce peace. And so what I want to do for the rest of the day is to give you some tools of how to actually do this. So how do you and me, when all of the world is crazy around us, how do we grab control of those thoughts that once again feel so powerful? And we want to, but we just don't know how. And here's just a clue on how to do it. And here's what we do. See, taking control of your thoughts means consistently, here's what you need to do, removing thoughts and replacing thoughts. Now, here's why I say this. It's impossible to simply remove bad thoughts if you don't replace them with good ones. That, that our mind is going to fill it up with something. So we just can't get there and go, I'm going to take captive of all the bad thoughts. No. You need to first do that, but you need to get in the habit of, okay, I've got this negative thought. Now, here's what i got to do. I've got to remove it first, but then I need to replace it with something greater or something more true. Let me just give you two little quick ways to do this in two little areas that you might be walking through. Here's the first one. Let's just say you battle with fear, like every other human being on planet Earth right now, okay? And so in your mind, you've got fear. So what do you have to do? You're going to have to replace your fear of the future with something greater, right, faith in God. You can't just remove fear. You have to replace it with God. In fact, do you realize that one of the most common commands that your heavenly Father has given you and me in a world that is crazy is to fear not. In fact, what we're told in the scriptures, I want you to see this is so important, about the aspect of fear and anxiety. It says this, that God has not given us a spirit, by the way, not just, it's not just in your mind, right? It, it's not just superficial, that fear and anxiety are actually spiritual battles, that your enemy wants to put in your thoughts things that produce fear and anxiety over faith. And it's a, but, but God, listen to this, but God has not given us a spirit or a thought of, of fear and of tim timidity, but instead of this power, like the Spirit of God lives in me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Of love, we talked about this, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure. Like to think of other people, to not turn inward in this moment. How can I protect myself and how can I serve others? And a self-discipline, what's a self-discipline? I'm gonna choose to fill my mind. I have the ability to once again focus my mind on things that produce peace. And what God is saying to us is we need to get this is that when you're starting to feel and think all of these thoughts that produce fear and anxiety and stress, what God's saying is, hey guys, that's not for me. Like, I'm the creator of the universe. I'm in control of all things. I'm sitting on the throne right now with full understanding of what's going on and what's happening. And I want you to understand something. When your mind goes to default mode and you start to do all that, that's because you haven't chose to take captive and you're not letting my word and my truth fill your mind. You're letting the enemy or the world do it. So how do we replace fear with faith? Well, here's how you do. Well, first is what? Let's just look at the scriptures, Right? So sometimes we're like, okay, God, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid. I can't just say, don't be afraid. I've got to replace the fear with faith. So I'm going to maybe read the book of Revelation, and I'm going to look at the end of the story, and I'm going to realize at the end, Jesus wins, the devil loses, and we go to heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? So even in the moment of fear, I realize, God Nothing surprises you. You are in control. Maybe fear starts to step in, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I'm just, I just, there. So maybe you turn worship music on, and you do the song, No Longer Slaves to Fear, which we have been doing and will continue to do as a church, uh, walk through this. And, and in that song, it's actually reminding us of all of these times when it looked fearful and hopeless on the outside, but God was actually involved turning bad things into good things. Maybe for you. Your fear is, God, do you really care about me? Like there's so much going on in this world. There's so many problems. God, there's billions of people. Do I even matter? And you need to remember the words that Jesus speaks to us where he says that your heavenly father, listen to this, he's so aware of what you are walking through right now that he actually knows the hairs 
on your head. That your God is aware and that he's able. He's told you to come pray for him, to pray to him. Jesus said you can have a peace that surpasses understanding and that we don't need to worry. And look at the birds of the air. And listen, you think that God takes care of them. How much more valuable are you than they? What are you doing? You're replacing, you're removing fear by replacing something greater than fear of faith and a God that is in control. And what God is telling you to do is this. You've got the authority to do it, but you've got to choose to do it because you and only you can control what you focus on. Here's the second thing I want to challenge us in, to replace something bad with something that's good. We've got to choose to remove, this is a big one, complaining and replace it with something more powerful and encouraging and life-giving, which is, once again, praising. Now, we did a study on this a while ago, and it was kind of fascinating to understand how we work, what, what naturally fills in our mind in default mode, and what naturally comes out of our mouth in our conversations. And the University of Florida, Florida did an actual study that showed, as they listened to people talk, that human beings naturally speak negative things, complaints, on a six to one ratio to praise or thanksgiving. In other words, this is habitual. We've got to grab hold and take captive of these things. Secondly, what we learned is that as you speak negative words and think negative thoughts, it produces in your mind a chemical called cortisol, which is poison to your body. And even beyond that, when you think about complaining and you're just wanna, you just want to share how all the bad things are and you feel like this is the right thing to do, I want you to understand there are side effects to this. I want you to see what Stanford University and their study talked about what happens with negative thoughts produce negative words or complaints. That Stanford University has shown that complaining shrinks the hippocampus, an area of the brain that is critical to problem solving and intelligent thought, damage to the hippocampus, is scary, especially when you consider that it's one of the primary brain's areas destroyed by Alzheimer's. And so what we got to do, what do we do? We got to take authority over not just our thoughts, but our words. So what do we do? God, instead of complaining about all the things that are inconvenient, what am I going to do? Hey, God, I'm just going to start out by saying thank you. I'm not one of the people that has coronavirus. We, we, right? 99% of us right now don't have it. So we're just going to thank God that we're one of those 99%. Maybe it's, hey, you know, God, I'm not going to complain about what am I going to do with my kids. I'm going to actually go thank you, Lord, that I have an opportunity where the world slows down and I get time with family that I might not have had before. Hey, God, listen, um, I, I'm not just going to complain about how hard my life is, but instead, Lord, I'm going to thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to reach and minister to people. Hey, God, I'm going to use this extra time, and I'm going to just thank you and praise you for all of the good things. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you for knowing the hairs of my head. Thank you for teaching me how to have peace. See what I'm doing? I'm turning complaining into praising. I'm taking captive the thoughts. I'm removing complaining, replacing it with something greater than complaining, with thanking God for all that he has done. And here is the beautiful thing that happens when we do this. Because right after um, the Mayo Clinic gave the guide on how your brain works, the next thing they talked about, which is so encouraging, is this, is they told us that scientists have learned that you and I, through taking captive our thoughts, can actually rewire our brain. It's called neuroplasticity, and that's what this means. It means the more you focus, or whatever you focus your thoughts on, that your brain is in a very efficient machine. And so whatever you choose to focus your thoughts on, your brain's always going to make it easier to do so. In fact, the statement they said is the neurons that fire together, wire together. And so complainers, the more you do it, you're rewiring your brain to be more negative, to be more critical. By the way, this is why if you've ever been in a relationship with someone that's critical or negative, you'll notice they always see life and see the bad things in their lives. Why? Because their brain has actually built shortcuts and bridges to complaining, negativity, fear, and anxiety. And here's what the Mayo Clinic was saying to us. That if we do what God told us to do, take captive our thoughts, Faith over fear, praising over complaining. We take control of not just filling our mind, but once again, focusing our mind. That you'll actually rewire your brain to experience greater peace. That you won't have to fight so hard to experience peace. That you will rewire your brain to see the good in things, not just the bad. You will rewire your brain and your emotions to find greater joy. 
You will rewire your brain to see the good in people, not just the bad, and experience greater peace over fear and anxiety. In other words, the battlefield is won and lost in your mind. And what the scriptures revealed and scientists have also discovered thousands of years later is that you have got to choose to use the most powerful pharmacy in the world, what's between your ears and your mind. And you've got to do it by not just filling your mind with things that produce peace, but also focusing your mind on things that produce peace. See, um, I, I've been battling with this a lot lately, and I want to give you some tools on how I actually have helped practice these things in my own life. So even before the whole virus thing went on, it's been a rough time for me. Many of you know I have a physical issue that kind of affects me in my life, and it's been acting up lately. My mother has not been doing well physically, and you, many of you know the battle she's going on, uh, going through, and that's, that's been difficult. And on top of that, my wife actually had a cancer scare, and we didn't know, and it was, it was a very fearful time, and we're walking through that, um, which, by the way, she, she does not, and we just got great results of that. But even beyond that, was this whole virus thing. What are the implications for us? Like all of us right now don't know the future. We don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know the financial implications. Some people that have margin are going to be better for longer, but how long? Some people, the world, you don't know. But hear me, not just dealing with all these things in my family, I'm also leading an organization that's called to be light in the darkness. How do we mobilize a community to reach them in this time? How do we keep our team safe? How do I provide? And so there's this incredible amount of pressure I was feeling on my shoulders. And in the midst of this, what I love is, I begin to put into practice the exact things we just taught you over the last couple weeks. And I begin to go, God, I'm, there's so much going on, and it's firing in so many different ways. And so what I chose to do is, okay, God, I'm going to shut the TV off for a little bit, and I'm going to fill my mind with things that produce peace. I'm going to spend more time in your word. I'm going to spend more time just putting worship on. I'm going to listen to podcasts when I work out. I'm going to go to first Saturday serve with my family and whatever's lovely and pure and holy. I'm going to meditate on these things. I'm going to fill these, my life and my mind with these things. And as I began to do that, it was amazing. Because then I took the next step, which is not just fill, but focus. And what I did was I began to journal like I never had before. Because I don't know if you're one of those people where your mind seems to be, you know, in control of you. It's like, I, I try to think about good things, and I'm good for like 30 seconds, and then my mind goes to default mode. And so what I did was this, and this is my challenge to you. I begin to journal. Like, I begin to go, God, right now, my wife, my mom, me, the church, everything that's going on financially, what's going to happen, where's going to go? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take cap of my thought, but I'm struggling to do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus my mind on a task, and the task I'm going to do is journal all the good things about you, God. And I pulled out this journal at home, and I just began to write, God, thank you for my family. God, thank you for your faithfulness. God, I remember that time things were really tough and you came through. Uh, God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've, you know, always been faithful in the past. And I just began to, once again, what are we doing? Moving my mind from default to focus. I'm finding and discovering all of these tasks, and I'm just writing down all of the goodness of God. I'm turning fear into faith, complaining into praising. And as I begin to do this, listen to this, the peace of God that surpassed all understanding began to guard my heart and my mind. And every one of us have this opportunity, but we need to understand something. We just can't wish peace. We just can't try for peace. What you fill your mind with and what you focus your mind on is going to determine the amount of peace or anxiety that you experience in this life, in this world. And so our heart as a church is to give you the tools to begin to fill your mind and to focus your mind on the things that produce peace. Let me close with this last scripture. This is God's promise to you and to me. You will keep, that means God is going to keep, in perfect peace all that's you, that's the worrier, that's the anxious, that's the person that knows the future. But all who trust in you, and here's the caveat, and all whose thoughts are fixed or focused on you. You and I can walk in a peace that surpasses on understanding, even when there's panic on the outside. But we have to choose to take control of our mind and move from default mode to focus mode and make sure we're fixing our mind on God. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for caring so much for us. I thank you so much, God, 
the promise that you've given us, that you know the hairs on our head, that you have our future in your control. And God, I just pray right now that we as human beings figure out ways, God, to fill our mind with things that produce peace, fill our children's mind with things that produce peace, and to focus our mind on things that produce peace. And as we are obedient to your calling, God, may you give us a supernatural peace that surpasses understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Journey Church, thanks so much for joining us today on this live stream. We're so excited that you're part of what's going on here. Remember, go to GoJourneyChurch.com for all updates of what we're doing, how we're impacting our community. Even though we can't come to church, we're still going to be the church. And if you have kids, we'd love for you to go to GoJourneyChurch.com slash kids. You can find videos for your preschooler, videos for your elementary student, and activities that you can do together. Uh, questions you can ask. We want to continue to resource you and equip you to lead your kids spiritually. And for all of you students who are watching this weekend, good news, we have our student service coming up that's going to be live streaming and our virtual small groups that's taking place. Even though we're separate, we're still connected. So you can find all that information at gojourneychurch.com slash students. That's right. Hey, next week we're going to be the same place, same time. So make sure to be inviting people to your watch parties. We'll see you online next week. Love you guys more than you know.